Hello and welcome to Learning Music with Pat. Today I'm going to be spending some time with penny whistles. I'm going to show them to you and one thing I really wanted to show you is a book that I got that was written for children but it's a wonderful book. It shows a lot in terms of how to read music and because of that and it was written for a penny whistle so because of that I brought in some of my penny whistles to show you and I'll show you and talk about them and then we'll get to the book talking about how to Read Time, it really is quite a good book. You know, I love children's books because they make things so clear and so simple and so easy to understand, and sometimes they're the best books you can buy when it comes to doing sciences and music and so forth. Well, here we go. Here is the penny whistles. Uh, the one that I'm going to be using most today will be this one here. This is a D, what's called a D penny whistle. The penny whistle is actually just a, a, a straight piece of tin or metal with a plastic top. They come in various sizes, they come in different colors, and there is kind of a history behind them. And the history is this, it's pretty simple, that years and years ago in Britain, they made whistles and they were made out of a tin and they had a top on them and then they sold them for a penny. So therefore they got the name of tin whistle because they're made out of tin or penny whistle because they only charged a penny for them. Now they play an amazing amount of music. They play as much as the recorder can play. They're not quite as complicated, they're not quite as sophisticated, but I've done lots and lots of work on, on these little instruments. This is a size D, and it's probably the one I'm gonna be using the most today if I show you anything. It's tin on the bottom with a blue cover. I have several of them. You can also get them in a kind of a gold shape with a red top. This one happens to be in the key of E flat. It looks like it's a little rusted out. I don't know why it looks like that, but it's also a penny whistle or a tin whistle. This one here is actually in the key of F. It's one of the smaller ones. It's got that gold colored uh, tin and it's got a red top to it. I have it with a green top as well. Here's one that is uh, green top and tin on the bottom, kind of like a gold tin on the bottom. It does not have a tone hole. None of the tin whistles have a tone hole in the back like the recorders do. I think that cuts down a little bit on what they can do. And it pitches them a little bit different too. The recorders have a, to have a tone hole in the back and they pitch a little bit lower. So at any rate, there's a difference in the pitch, but not a whole lot. And this is a, a, a gold one with a green top. This is also in the key of D. It's just like the first one that I showed you that I'm going to be using more, but the coloration is a little bit different. And then, of course, I have one uh, that's here, the red one with a red top, the key of F. I think that's about the smallest that I have. Now, I have one that's quite a bit larger. It's called a low D penny whistle. I've had it in here before. And this is it. It's really quite large. It's a beautiful instrument. It plays very, very well. Like any of the other penny whistles, it has no tone hole in the back. It has the fipple type mouthpiece, which we've discussed before. It has the tone holes in the front, but notice the finger stretches between those tone holes. I can no longer use it for solos. But you can see the stretching that you'd have to have in your fingers. I can do it, but I can't do it for, for long because it's just too stretched out. And if you have a hand that has a problem or if you have, you know, arthritis or if you're elderly or if you're young, it's almost impossible to get all those fingers stretched so that you can actually play a scale. But it plays beautifully, has a wonderful tone. I love the tone. It's terrific. You can take the top off, not, but you would only do it for the cleaning purposes. This is the largest that they make. And it, it, it is, as they say, a low D. And what I showed you at first was a D. It's in the same pitch. It's just a lot larger. 
Now, there are a lot of other little instruments that are similar to a penny whistle, or a, uh, sometimes I also call them Irish flutes because they do a lot of Irish music. As I say, they're amazing in the amount of music they can play. But I have other instruments that are very similar to the penny whistle or the tin whistle. For example, this one is a Shaw's. It's, it's pointed. You know, it's not cylindrical, it's conical, and it has a wooden plug in, the, in the, here, which I have my finger on. It has the same kind of mouthpiece, but it has a little plug in it, and that makes the tone a little bit softer. It may not sound soft right here, but trust me, it is a little bit softer. I have a Clark's. Uh, D. This is a Clark's D flute. It's also conical and it has a plug, a wooden plug by the mouthpiece right where my finger is, labium in front, fipple mouthpiece. I hold it here. You can see it better, I guess, if I hold it here. And I'll play just a couple of notes so you can see. Not particularly loud. No tone holes in the back. You can see how that mouthpiece uh, slants. You see how it has that kind of slant in it, and it has that cork in it or that wooden piece in it. It's actually wood, and it has a little space between that, that piece of wood and, a, and the uh, outer edge of it. I don't know if that comes in clearly, but okay, you got it. Good, thanks. And uh, that makes it a softer tone. So you have the Shaw's E. E is an unusual key to get a penny whistle in, but this is the Shaw's E. Then, of course, you have the melody flutes. I brought these in before, and I just brought in four, just so you can see the various colors. They're very intriguing because of their colors. This is the orange one. They don't play very well. They do play some, but it's all the same idea, except it's not near as good as what the penny whistles are. They're plastic and they are, you know, kind of inexpensively made, basically for children, and children love them, and I like to keep them on hand for children. The pink one, this is also a melody. You can see the raised tone holes in the front, which is handy for new students because it's easier for them to know where to put their fingers. And the same thing here, this is kind of a rose pinky color, and it has the same raised thing in the green ones. Now I want to mention the advantage of anything which, with a raised thing is that it's easier for students to find when they're first beginning their, where their hands go. When you pick up an instrument, once you learn how to play it or you're in the process of learning how to play it, the one thing that you shouldn't have to do is look and see if you got the fingers on right. Now see, if I try to do an octave, it's out of pitch. If you try to go higher than that, it doesn't work. But at any rate, they do play well enough that children can learn something from them. They also have a little raised area in the back where you can put your left thumb that's made for it and you're a little raised part for you to put your right thumb. Remember, left hand always goes on top, right hand always goes on, on the bottom. There's a, a carved out place, a little raised place that you can put your fingers and your thumb so you know where they go, and then your, your fingers in front kind of fall into place. <laughs> And that it plays a little bit, you know, and that's the kind of thing. Now, I also have the Pearl Piper here. It's raised a little bit. Now, I only paid less than $2 for the Pearl Piper. The Pearl Piper plays well. As a matter of fact, I've done solos on it. It pitches well, it pitches to itself, it pitches with other instruments, and it's certainly worth the less than $2 I paid for it. I was in a store uh, with a friend of mine, and my friend said, hey, what's this? 
And she looked down and I looked and there they were. And I picked up a couple of them and I says, they're mine, that's where they are, that's who they belong to. And I bought two of them. I've not been disappointed with them because they do play quite well. They look an awful lot like the melody flutes that don't play near as well, but don't they look alike? You know, it looks almost like they've been made by the same company, but I don't think so. The, the names on them are different, but they really do look good. So at any rate, those are all very similar, but the tin whistles that I'm going to be using, going to be showing you, they really play very, very well. And I've done lots of solo work, and the, the, tr and the thing is they don't have any tone hole in the back. There's no back place where you can put your thumbs and so forth, but they're very nice. And they have a two octave range. So they're really a very good instrument and I can use them. The only thing is if I use them with recorder music, they're gonna pitch one step different than the recorder will pitch because of the fact that, I think, because it doesn't have a tone hole in the back. That's a D on the uh, tin whistle. It's a little bit different pitch. So, uh, and uh, I do have the tone hole on the recorder, but they don't pitch exactly the same. They're a little bit off. Well, what I wanted to bring in, and I'll start it. I don't know if I'll finish it with this segment or not. I have a book here. It's made as an instruction book for the tin whistle. It has a picture of the tin whistle on the front. And in it, I want to show you some pages of the music because it, it very clearly spells out some of the things I've been trying to teach you in terms of music reading. I mean, it's large, it's clear, and we checked it this morning and it can show up fairly easily on, a, on my uh, uh, board here so you'll be able to see it. This is basic music reading. I'm going to not go through all of the pages, but I will go through some of the pages. So here's one of the things. This is a scale, uh, uh, and this is, so th this is a fingering chart. I'm going to be going into fingering charts, both this segment and next segment, but the fingering chart is this. You have the scale. A scale is where you just have a group of notes, and they go up sequentially, either by a half step or a whole step. This starts on D. Well, the penny whistle that I'm using is in the key of D. So D, E, F sharp. You notice here there is an F sharp. I put them in this morning. F sharp and C sharp. The key of D has two sharps in it. And usually when you get to the key signature, they're written in. They didn't have it on the scale, so I put them in. So D, E, this is your F sharp. The F sharp raises a tone by a half a step. There are no flats in this book, but if there were, the B flat or any flat will lower a pitch by a half step. This is the F sharp, G, A, B. This is a C sharp, notice the sharp is in front of it, in front of the note that you have to sharp, and this is the D. So there's an octave here, this low D, and this high D, they're an octave apart. And what you have here is you have a picture. I don't know, is this, well, this will come in fairly quickly, uh, fairly easily, I mean. This is a, a little uh, image, a little diagram of the tin whistle. And when you have the closed notes, like you have here, those all, all those little holes that are closed, that's where your fingers have pressed over the tone holes and closed the tone holes. On something like this, then none of the tone holes are closed. So you get just a circle with no coloration in it. And that's we're going, going to be the C sharp. Incidentally, that's the same way as you play a C sharp when you're playing the saxophone. And I can use a C sharp, I can use that fingering also in terms of playing the recorder, although the recorder shows a different fingering for a C sharp. I can use this as an alternate fingering. A lot of the fingerings for a lot of these woodwind instruments are about the same. We're going to get into that. Now, let me uh, 
change the page here. Whoops. Now, one of the things this book does that I don't do, let me move it over here. It'll be easier to see. Uh, they elongate the whole notes. Remember, I've told you a whole note is just a circle. They elongate the whole note so it fills up the whole, the whole space here. You would never see that in a piece of music. You just would never see it. Uh, however, they do it in this book, and if it's half, then it's a half note. If it's a whole space it takes up, then it's a whole note. But you won't see that in music. That's the only thing I don't really like about this book that's not traditional, but they're doing it to make it easier for students, I think, to learn. Let re me review this for you. This is your treble clef. This is what it looks like when it's done correctly. And here is a bar line. This is a bar line. These are between it. These are called measures, and uh, you can put notes in those measures. These are time signatures. There's no time signature in here, but if I wanted to have four beats to a measure, three beats to a measure, what this book does is show you the time signatures that they're using to teach in the book. This is a four-four time, this is three-four time, and this is two-four time. What that means is you have four beats to the measure and a quarter note gets one beat. Three beats to a measure, a quarter note gets one beat. Two beats to a measure, the quarter note gets one beat. Whenever you see that four, it means quarter note. And that quarter note, which is right here, it's a, this is the body of the note, and the stem goes down. You can have the stem up or down. It doesn't make any difference. It's still a quarter note. So I wanted to review that with you. And uh, let's see, switch another page here. Here is a time signature. Whoops, let me, oh, I can use this one day. You don't need to change it. This is um, the treble clef and 4-4 four, four time. Now here, I'm going to skip all of that because that's where they elongate a, a measure or a note to make it easier to read if you're a beginner, but I don't think it makes it easier to read, and music isn't written that way. I want to point out this. This is a full rest. This would be a whole rest. If you have a whole note that's worth four beats, this rest, I'm sorry, this rest here is worth two beats. Two beats for a half rest. I said whole rest, but I meant it's a half rest. A half rest where you have a little kind of squarish looking thing and it pops up from the third line up. You count the staff lines as one, two, three, four, five. This is on the third line up and it's just like a little rectangle looking area, almost like a square coming up from that third line. So that is going to be a half rest. It's going to be worth two beats. Now, uh, this one here on this side is a whole rest. It hangs down. You still have the same squarish look, but it hangs down from the fourth line up. So this hangs down, and if you think of it as being heavier because it hangs down, this gets four beats. This one is, say, if you want to think of it as being lighter, it comes up instead of down. That's worth two beats. Two beat rest, four beat rest. The whole rest would be the only rest in a measure, just like the whole note would be the only note in a measure, because it's the whole thing. So half rest up on the third line, whole rest down on the fourth line, whole half. And just think of it as being, if it's down, it's heavier, it's worth more, it has more beats to it. So down on the fourth is going to be your whole rest, usually worth four beats in 4-4 four, four time, and this would be your half rest coming up from the third line, and it would be worth two beats, so it's worth half as much. So that's how you can maybe help to remember that. I know I've gone through a lot of this with you before, but this book does it so well 
that I think it would be it was worth looking at the book. Now here we have here, I want to just point out, you have both a key signature and a time signature. Let me move this over. Rick, you don't have to keep running around. I can just move this. Ah, good. Now, the 4-4 four, four time, there's your time signature. Four beats to a measure, one, two, three, four. And uh, the fourth beat it has a four there, so it's talking about a quarter note. A fourth is a quarter note, and that is a note that gets one beat. This is your key signature. A key signature, right after your treble clef or bass clef, if you're using a bass clef instrument, tells you how many sharps and how many flats. Now this book doesn't have any flats, but this is, has two sharps. This is the key of D. This instrument here that I showed you before is written in the key, is made to play in the key of D. So it's a D instrument, and what they've done is they've used the D instrument and they've patterned this book around the key of D. Remember, D is two sharps, and it's going to be on the line that's sharp. So this is a sharp, this is F. Remember, every good boy does fine. This is the first line up, or the fifth line up is F. So the sharp on that F means that every F that you play is going to be sharp. You so, and we do have a few. Here's a couple right here. And if you ran into every C, every C would be sharped as well. Now, I don't see clearly any Cs in this song, but we do have songs with Cs in them. And in that key, anytime you have a C, that C is going to be a sharp. Now, there is a way to make that null and void, but I will be discussing that later on. We're talking about general things here. Whoops. Let me switch, oh I know, I, let me, I do want this page here. So I'll move this over here. Here again is your two sharps, F and C. And um, here is the fingerings. This is like a little diagram of the penny whistle, the mouthpiece on top, and there's a little circle in the bottom indicating the bottom of the instrument. You may not even be able to see it, but it's not important. And you can see that every hole that is darkened, that is colored in, is a, is a, hole, a finger hole that you have covered with your finger. Okay, so this is going to be your B, your A, your G with three fingers, and your F sharp with four fingers. It goes B, A, G, F. Now why that is called an F sharp is because the instrument is made to play in the key of D, so it's made to play an F sharp. And then you have your E, one, two, three, left hand covered, and then two on your right hand covered. That's the fingering for an E. And this is all of them covered. That's the fingering for a D, and it's exactly the way it is for the saxophone, for the flute, for the recorder, many of the fingerings quite similar. And then it goes through time signature, 4-4. Four, four. four beats to the measure, the quarter note, four on the bottom, means that that quarter note gets one beat. So if I'm to count this, one, two, three, four. And you see that's the bar line. That's the end of the measure. And then uh, over here, one, two, three, four, there's another bar line. This here is what they put in for a half note. I don't really like that, but that's what they do. So I'm kind of skipping that because normally you don't do that. Normally all your notes are round. But because this is a children's book and they're trying to make things very clear, I think that's the reason they did it like that. Although I wouldn't teach like that, but there's a lot about this book that's very, very good. Now, things to remember. I'm going to move this up. I'm just going to read this off. Uh, tongue the beginning of each note as if saying two. Now, we've gone over tonguing before. It's critically important that you know how to do it. You're not going to get any smooth tones if you don't know how to do it. You put the instrument in your mouth and you put it like half, you put it like a third of the way in 
and as if you're saying ta, ta, to when you're playing it. Now I notice that I'm running kind of short on time here, so what I'm going to do is close it here, but I'm going to continue with this book next time. I want to get this done because there's a lot in it that's very easily understood, and it will teach you or really give you a real heads up in terms of music reading, so I want to continue with this next time. Please join me then.